Welcome to the official Danish residence of Denmark in New York. I'm Berit Basse, Consul General of Denmark. This residence serves as the stage of diplomacy, but it is also my home and it is said to be the highest point in Denmark. Here at the residence we host hundreds of high-level guests every year and our events range from traditional diplomatic dinners and receptions to business roundtables, artist salons, panel discussions and much more. Design has always been a key part of our DNA. Danish design is about long-lasting, high-quality and sustainable materials. It's simple, durable, social and holistic. As a leader on the Green Agenda and as a climate front post, we constantly focus on rethinking design with innovative, sustainable and circular solutions. Denmark has a long history of functional and practical design. Most of you have heard about the famous architects Arne Jacobsen and Hans Wigner, but a new generation of Danish designers are inspired by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to address responsible consumption and production. We're excited to share these design values with our guests through furniture and tableware. These are all important elements that constitute the story of Denmark as a nation of design and innovation. We're delighted to welcome you to the residents of Denmark and to the world of Danish design. Design Diplomacy is a series of conversation events that take place in diplomatic residencies all around the world. Two designers get together and have this deck of cards in which playful yet intelligent questions challenge the players as well as the audience to consider design as a form of intercultural exchange. How it works is that we build international links for diplomatic representations, design professionals, as well as audiences. The Design Diplomacy was created by Helsinki Design Week. That was five years ago, and ever since then, we've played Design Diplomacy card games in over 20 residencies around Helsinki every year in September. Additionally, these conversation events have taken place in Reykjavik, Tokyo, in New York, in uh, Madrid, Oslo, Berlin, as well as Canberra. We at Helsinki Design Week and in Weekly, we believe in international cooperation and in the possibility to change the world through meaningful encounters and interactions. Sometimes all you need is a deck of cards. Incidentally, the word diploma derives from a Greek word that means a paper folded in two. I'm happy to welcome you all to the official residence of Denmark in New York and to the 2021 edition of the Nordic Design Diplomacy Salon and during uh, the NYC by Design Days. My name is Beat Basse, I'm Consul General here in New York and I'll be your host and moderator. It is the second time that the five Nordic consulates in New York team up with Helsinki Design Week to present design diplomacy with a Big Apple twist. We premiered the New York series back in 2019 with live audiences and receptions at the Nordic residences. Due to pandemic restrictions, the programs this year will all be virtual, but hopefully not less engaging and interesting. Once again, our conversations will revolve about a specially curated deck of cards posing questions to design professionals from both sides of the Atlantic on their careers and their tastes, their transformative influences, design practices, as well as their vision for how design may help transform and shape the future uh, or our shared future. Today I'm very proud to introduce to you our two specially invited guests, Danish architect Eva Jensen and American architect and film director Carl Bergman. 
Eva Jensen was born and raised in Denmark and studied at uh, the Danish, Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen and at Milan Politecnico. Before establishing her New York, uh, her New York office, Eva was also engaged as assistant professor and worked for renowned international architects. Eva is the founder of Eva Jensen Design, an award-winning New York-based architecture studio that works in a range of design projects with a focus on high-end residential architecture, on interiors and furniture designs and architecture installations. Carl Bergman is a US-based architect and founder of Architecture and Design Film Festival, ADFF, where he serves as festival director. ADFF provides a unique opportunity to educate, entertain and engage people who are passionate about the world of architecture and design. Now, in its 12th season, the festival has grown to become the largest film festival dedicated to the creative spirit of architecture and design. Kyle also serves as president for the Pacific Rim Project, whose mission is to use the process of designing and building parks as a tool to connect people and communities around the Pacific. It's really great to have both of you with us here physically today for this card game conversation and at the residence of Denmark in New York. We've given today's conversation the bold title, The Power of Design, Connecting People with Nature and Culture. Even as we will let the deck card determine the flow of the conversation, I dare say I know both of you to be passionate about topics such as nature's influence on the cultured landscape and vice versa, cross-pollination of cultural design traditions, and what the pandemic has caused on us and on humankind and how we think and prioritize, and not least the power of design as a means of storytelling and a source of infinite inspiration. So without further ado, I think we should uh, get started with this Danish edition of the 2021 Nordic Design Diplomacy Salon series with the first question. So I will start. This will get us started for sure. <laughs> ah, it's the year 2100 and people are talking about you. What would you like to be remembered for? I think we should start with you, Eva. Wow, thank you. And thank you for having me. And um, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think, um, I think this is an opportunity for vision. And I think I would want to be remembered for having uh, made a difference in just made a contribution and a difference in just uh, a little aspect of design and architecture that would be um, that would make me very happy. That's a good one. It's also a good one to start on. Yeah. Over to you, Kyle. So I hope the world, if I am remembered, remembers me for being uh, human, having bringing new humanity to everything I do, be it architecture or whatever else. I mean, I think we have to lead with that, and if. Uh, people remember me for that, I'd be really happy. Make an impact. Wonderful. I think we should go on. Put it here. To the next one. Did you choose your profession or did it choose you? Mm. Um, I, I think it chose me. I went into undergraduate school having no idea what I wanted to do and I just started taking classes in everything. And I started, the first thing I got interested in was filmmaking. And then I did an architecture class, and I realized, ah, that's what I want to do. And I left filmmaking behind. Yeah. And they're actually very, very similar uh, actions, which I know later. Uh, but it, it, uh, I discovered it, and, it, and I had no idea when growing up that I would uh, be interested in being an architect. Except my favorite building in New York growing up was the Guggenheim. My parents used to bring me there, and I would just run up and down and up and down and up and down. And so maybe that had some impact. <laughs> maybe it had. Over to you, Eva. Yes. Did it choose you? I think it, it, it's definitely it's a dialogue, but I think it, uh, it came to me. Yeah. And I think there are certain moments. There is uh, watching uh, my parents build the house as a child. Yeah. 
and roaming around in the unbuilt structure. There is a moment in high school when the, I went to school uh, across the Roskilde Cathedral and uh, it was re being renovated and on, I chatted with the architect whenever I could and he showed me, uh, showed me a very small solar cell yeah. and I think the light bulb went on there. Uh, it was a special moment. And then I went on after high school to take a trip around the world, spent time in uh, Sydney at some point and uh, spent time in front of the Sydney Opera by Jørgen Utzon and uh, just had that opportunity to be every morning sitting there watching the light every afternoon uh, and I think that started a moment where I first applied for philosophy, got, got into that, went on to study film and television for a year and then went to architecture school. That's interesting. So, so for both of you, there's the Guggenheim and there's the Sydney Opera House. So it's interesting how small things really can sort of inspire yeah. well, some, well of the, to choice. some of the most important yeah. buildings. They yeah. are in the iconic century. buildings, right? Yeah, and it's the power of architecture that allows that. Like, you know, you don't know as a kid or as a young person why you're attracted to that, but yeah. you didn't go to the other buildings. You ended up going to the Sydney Opera House because it was so powerful. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. So now it becomes a little bit more uh, concrete. Um, the question is, what are you currently working on, Eva? So I'm very happy to say that I, um, so I work on rest high end residential, but I've also um, recently, a couple of years ago, we won uh, my office um, a competition, a design built competition for a um, portable structure, circle shade. And, um, we developed that and it's also a salute to funding cultural projects, uh, design projects, which was founded by NISCA and some other foundations here in New York with the Architectural League and uh, Soccer Sculpture Park. And we just won a first prize in a competition um, called Rethinking the Future last week wow. uh, out of uh, India, of all places, and they did such a magnificent job coordinating of this whole thing during the hard time they're having right now. So this is, so we're at a new moment with this after having been uh, acknowledged and nominated, but now there is a, there's a real sort of thing. So that is something that I'm... Congratulations. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. That sounds great. Yes. Uh, so I'm split between two things. So running the film festival now is a full-time uh, event, but from a design perspective, we're working on trying to uh, secure our next park, these parks we do called Pacific Rim Parks, and we do them around Asia. And it's usually two or three years between, from the time we start a project to actually build the park. And so right now we are, uh, and it's uh, laying the foundation for our next possible park. And we're talking to some people in New Zealand and in Panama and trying to figure out uh, where the next parks will be. But it's too early to reveal yet? Well, we don't know. I wish I could reveal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to wait for it's that. A, it's, a quite, it's a process to get the parks going. What makes you get out of bed in the morning? You know, I wake up starving and, and, I, and, I, and I just love every, I don't know, I, I get up, I, I jump out of bed. I'm lucky, That's I'm fine. a good sleeper and I just jump out of bed. I feel, I, I feel engaged. Eva? I, uh, what gets me up in the morning is, uh, I know there's a cup of tea waiting a little <laughs> way down, but I, it's, I, I wake up really um, sort of, um, sort of going through of what's, what's, the, what's the opportunities, what am I dealing with, so I spent the first moments doing that, meditating, um, and then I go on to yoga, and then from there I deserve a cup of tea, and I'm very <laughs> happy and excited to get on with the day. <laughs> And talking about getting on with the day, uh, this is uh, always interesting. What have you practiced more than 10,000 hours? I think it's this thing about you have to practice something 10,000 hours before you are really good at it. Yeah. Um, yes. 10,000 hours, it's hard to know what I've, what I've mastered over the years. Because yeah. um, my tendency is to keep changing things. Yeah. Although, um, what have I mastered? I think I'm still working on mastering things. I've mastered, um, I've maybe mastered cooking. I love to cook. And I've mastered uh, 
throwing frisbees. I've thrown frisbees my whole life and played old frisbee. And I'm very, very good at that. And I'm working on mastering other things. And I hope, hopefully we'll master doing parks by the end of the, my life. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working on parks. We're working on parks. <laughs> and you, Eva? Well, so I have spent many hours working, uh, designing, and in architecture, very hands-on. Um, it's both an intuitive process and an uh, uh, analytic process. And I think um, what I really enjoy is that sense of um, distilling mm -hmm. and always tr take the complex to the simple. So I, something I try to keep practicing because that, um, that really gets results in, in what I do, I find. So still, still trying to master. Keep practicing. I think we all are. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all are. Wonderful. Let's get uh, let's get moving uh, more into sort of design practices, maybe, with a new question here uh, for you. And we will start with you, Eva, this time. Describe the aesthetics in your home country. Yes. Which is Denmark. Yes. Uh, beautiful Denmark. Um, it's a dear country. And I think uh, the aesthetic is, as I just was talking about, simplicity. And it comes from um, Denmark being a small country. Uh, the horizon, as I moved here, the horizon became more and more dominant in my thinking. And I walk a lot around uh, the ocean. Um, and I realized I was always trying to capture the horizon, but it comes from Denmark. And um, as we are quite, uh, flat but rolling hills, uh, soft rolling hills. Um, so I think also this that we really don't have a lot of wilderness left, left in Denmark. We have a, a, what we call a cultured landscape, so culture, um, cultured nature, the cultured landscape. Um, and that means we economize with our means and that means that Again, the distillness re reducing, like a cook reducing the sauce, the reduction gives the taste. Um, I think that goes into our whole design methodology that I think Denmark is very known for and excel in. Interesting. And it makes it, it gives a timeless design when it's, you know, when you take the complex needs and production means and whatever, all that mm -hmm. into, a, into a product you get that universal time to that timeless design. Hmm. Same question to you, Claude. So for the U.S., it's too big to say with a whole yeah. country because it's yeah. so diverse. But I'll talk about New York, where I'm from. And it's interesting. So growing up here in New York, uh, it really, although we have a lot of great older buildings, you know, that are well known, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of great new architecture being made in New York. And as I think we had an inflection point after 9-11. And there was all this public attention paid to what was going to happen downtown, the mm -hmm. rebuilding. I think it re-engaged uh, New York with architecture and design. Mm -hmm. And things like the High Line, and so many interesting buildings have come out. And I think there's been this great reawakening since that tragedy mm -hmm. because the, the city got engaged with architecture and design and debated and discussed it. So it's, it's, since then, it's been much more, uh, people have been much more involved in the uh, design of the city, mm -hmm. I think. I, I agree with you, Carla. Yeah. I yeah. think that's very right. And yeah. also more influx of European design into a new influx of European design yeah. in, in dialogue, so across pollination, across the pond, yeah. Yeah. in a new way that's met yeah. a yeah. lot. Yeah, I, very I, interesting time. Yeah, it is. And, you know, and I, think, um, I think that America has been more open uh, to a wider range from an architectural perspective yes. and, uh, and other perspectives as, as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, what skills did your grandparents have that you're jealous of? I think we've come yeah. to you, Kyle. So skills that my grandfather's parents had that um, my grandfather, my mother's father was so industrious. He is someone who uh, grew up in Vienna. Uh, in his, it was very successful in the middle of his life, lost everything and came to America uh, during World War II and had to start back again in his mid-40s to re-put his life together and worked so diligently for his whole life. And as a young man, when I knew him, I thought, oh God, Grandpa was so like too focused on work and I realized the drive that he needed to make that happen. Yeah. Uh, and it's always impressive and I wish I had more of that. So there's inspiration from that. Yeah. 
And you, Eva? Yes, so I, um, I have a story of a great-grandfather that immigrated from Denmark to Germany and became a successful entrepreneur uh, there. And my grandfather, his son, um, became a civil engineer and a specialist in metals um, and had an enormous drive as well um, and be ended up becoming called to England as a specialist. Um, and I think that has inspired me together with um, also more close family to um, seek internationally to go beyond Danish borders but still have a foundation in Denmark. Um, and um, there's always been a mix of international people coming. That, that's been inspiring. Um, not really, I think, I'm not, I'm inspired by their drive to, to go out and work and succeed, definitely. Yeah. It seems like you both have the same inspiration and I can see where you have your drive from, yeah. you know, always, you know, pursuing opportunities and, and work. Yeah. I, I love the question about grandfather too because, you know, so we go through this like grandparents do something, parents react to that. So grandchildren and grandparents have this bonding connection. Yes, I agree. There's this like balance back and forth yeah. and it's, it's so fascinating to think about what your grandparents gave you yeah. or what you learned from them. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, uh, so I have this thing from, they were very in, in, in the materials. I have a long history in forestry from the, my family side too. So that gets me back to nature. So there's these, the metal, the metals and the wood, <laughs> they're there. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> with, with pollination yeah. from my father. So yeah. the, everything was about pollinating and making new plants. Nice. Talking about <laughs> objects, I have a new question for you. What constitutes a perfect object? for you? Ooh. Um, a perfect object, uh, is it also a vessel? Can it be a vessel or mostly an object? So I think it's, there has to be a, it has to exemplify a universal truth. So it, uh, where, where form, material, and structure uh, unifies. So it goes from the unmeasurable to the measurable and you experience something unmeasurable. Uh, and it's always gonna give you a new, it's gonna, it's gonna speak to you anew every time. That's, that's one I That's very philosophical instead of uh, Yes, but I think the good things have that. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Mm. So perfect always scares me uh, because <laughs> it's such a, it's such a yeah. challenging word. Um, but what really, uh, the things that I gravitate towards, and I, I like, a lot of different styles. I, I'm not so much cared about style, but I care about intention. And so when something really follows through on what, it, what it's supposed to do and want it, wants to do, and something that um, is something that you just gravitate to, and you, sometimes you don't even know why. You can't put words to it. Those are the things that really are, continue to uh, blow me away as far as objects. Yeah. But I think you're right, Kyle. A perfect is a, is a very, we, we, we can, um, we can, you know, excellence is what we can strive towards. Mm -hmm. Perfect is an ideal world that we never sh can or should reach, but we can have it as an ideal. But we will. Yeah. It, yeah. Per striving for perfect causes so many can cause so many problems. So it's not something in your daily work that is sort of the objective. You're not burdened by this idea that it should be perfect. Yes. I gave that up <laughs> a long time ago. No, and I'll never get there. <laughs> I, I think I think definitely it's a, that's a struggle, but I think you have to recognize that you have you you know there's something about uh, in, in architecture and just you are dealing with the health and welfare of people. So you have to be very conscientious of yeah. not making mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and then, you, so you, you're checking, you're double checking, you're triple checking, and therefore um, you have to be very conscientious not uh, to make mistakes. And you become a little bit of a control freak because of that. You become very controlling, but it comes out of a concern. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that can lead to the perfection, but you're, you have to go towards excellence. I totally, I totally can understand what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So yeah. it's this constant uh, pursuance of that. Right. Another question. Who do you create for? Always for yourself. I mean, you, you got to like, you got, even if you're creating for other people, like, you know, you make a 
throw a dinner party for people, you want to like everything you make, you want to th think it's delicious and enjoyable, even if it's not your exact thing. So you got to satisfy. It's like, I think artists work like that. Okay. And uh, production people, uh, companies work differently. Mm-hmm. Um. I think I worked, uh, it's, I think you have to think about, I don't, I work from my understanding and for what I can come, you know, basically process, but I think uh, my job is to listen and to have empathy and understand uh, what people come to with of needs. Uh, and for architecture, it's the program, which is really the script for the story, so to speak, if we have to, tr you know, go to filmmaking. And, and that, is a that is the DNA of, of the project as you start. And um, so I'm definitely creating in dialogue with my surroundings yeah. and with who, whoever has the needs. And for the, for the benefit of humankind, hopefully, you know that's that's always what you try for. And I want to add to that because I think that that's right. When you because when you're doing architecture, yeah. you're not. It's not just for yourself. It's for who you're doing it for and yeah. the, and the yeah. users and all whole other things. Yeah. And I was kind of thinking about it. It's just like in the deep core of me. I want to make sure I feel good about yes, it. Yes, of course. But of course, you have to. You know, architecture is a public act, and if you're not thinking about everyone else, uh, it's. Yeah. Probably not going to succeed. It's 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 both sides. It yeah. is. I, can, I, I mean, can of totally course, you want to feel good about what yeah. you do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if not, you know. We have to move on. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is a perfect question for the two of you. Why is it important to talk about design? Um, Eva. Yes, I think um, I think it's uh, important to create awareness because uh, design is something you interact with. You move through it. Uh, and a, if we can create awareness and um, have a higher level of experience with it, that will, I think, with the power of design, I think you can create a better world, an improved world. So that, I think, is important. Um, my processes as how I do it is, is, my little wor is my world, but I think that part is really important because it this is where, you know, it's part of the creation of what we're surrounding us with. Yeah. So there, there's a larger purpose almost. There is a larger humankind. purpose, yeah. yes. Those that we create. And there is now especially how, what, you know, going into how is design produced, how is it going to, where is it going to end up, yeah. how are we going to be healthy and well in these spaces. There's a whole new thing which has, has been there all the time, but it has gotten a new level of attention that we have to get very involved with. So for that reason, just right now, it's very important, I think. Excellent. I'll give you another question. Okay. Because uh, I would like to know, is there something you would change in your field's education in your home country? So mm -hmm. here in the mm -hmm. US, for example. I think. Tons. I think, <laughs> I think the education, uh, there's a lot of great things about being educated as an architect. You know, there's really, it's a strong education, uh -huh. but I think it's too narrow. And I think that uh, the education needs to be able to communicate to a wider audience. And I think as architects, and I'll talk just in American context, we're really great at just talking among ourselves with jargon and other things, and we have dynamic conversations. But we're, what we're not so good at as, as a group is expanding that conversation and, and, and bringing that to a wider audience. Mm. So I think one of the things would be to do that and also it's just a brutal process to go. It, take, it takes five to ten years to recover uh, from going to architecture school in America, and uh, I think that it's um, uh, it could be much better. It, it makes uh, so much sense what you say uh, after having listened to both of you talking about uh, the task of, of architecture and design and uh, how we have to interact and, and take humankind uh, challenges into consideration. Maybe just a quick answer from you would you also would you would that be the same in denmark would you like oh. to 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 change some of the same uh, so things i'm not in touch so much with how okay. denmark is right now uh, i think for me when i went there it was both very open but also very much found in the danish tradition so i was one of those that wanted to i love the danish tradition but i also wanted to acknowledge the that there was a bigger world 
Yeah. And I, I went out, studied abroad, and uh, but I think what is great in America is the um, that you it's easier to study in different fields while you're putting together your degree of architecture. Where in mm. Denmark, um, we are more now they put the campus together, but we are more in Divide. architecture. You select, yeah, and you can't really sort of go to philosophy. So oh, okay, mm. so there's okay well. Okay. We will go on, and uh, I think it's time to also look a little bit into the future. Okay, the crystal ball. <laughs> I'll ask you to look in the crystal ball. <laughs> so, what do you consider the biggest challenge that humankind needs to solve? Ooh. Clearly, are the way we're destroying the environment. I mean, I mean, it just—it's just so clear. It is so. Uh, Sad that we, especially as an American, as a, as a great polluter that we've been, that we haven't taken a better step towards uh, trying to rectify that. Yeah. Yes, I, I think I agree. Climate change is one of our biggest challenges, along with uh, water, clean water, water um, which is part of climate change. But I think that is, I mean, there, you know, there are programs that we, you know, the SDGs. Um, I think another one is a world population of eight million, yeah. eight billion, sorry, eight billion. And it's just from 1700 to now, it's been an incredible uh, growth of people. So I think population density and the climate change with that and their inter uh, yeah. yeah, those two are probably. I, I think I have a great question for you to expand on also what you're saying. The question is, Give a concrete example of how design has made the world better. Uh, well, or maybe I, it could make the world I, better. I think the w design <laughs> has made the world better in many ways. I mean, there's buildings that uh, have um, have done a great job of that, where the, uh, showing uh, the way for uh, using um, sustainability, uh, everything from. Uh, um, Natural, natural air, um, ventilation, daylight, uh, all these things that are still on its way into the US but not as integrated, whereas it's more integrated in Europe. Uh, there is um, uh, objects, just as uh, very simple objects as creating a um, filtration system for clean water for, for Africa. Um, I think that actually a Danish uh, design group won that years ago, and there is small solar cells. For also, there is, there's both the small objects and the larger schemes. Both mm -hmm. have made an impact. Yeah. Yeah. There's count. There's so many places where design has made uh, the world a better place. I mean, and there's the environmental, but there's also the social opportunity. When design is done well. And it allows humans to interact and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and engage. And when it's done poorly, it minimizes that opportunity. And you end up with cold, urban env environments. And I think that um, you know, we're constantly trying to look for what's better design and pushing the design to a better place. And it is a huge difference in um, places that are better designed compared to not. So we continue a little bit in the same sphere. The question is, what would you say to a person who says the world doesn't need more objects? I think it's so I, Or no, I, I think, I don't can know. we start with you, Carl? OK. So um, the world doesn't need more objects. It maybe needs better objects, but not more objects. Mm. And, you know, and there's, um, there's actually, in, in Denmark, there's the, the Index Design Awards, which is a really fascinating uh, design awards. And it's not about what's the most beautiful object, but how does it function? What what makes it become a better object? And so I don't think we need more stuff. We just need better stuff. Better stuff. Better functionalities. Uh, better functionality. Be better. Better. Uh, and cradle to grave, like the the whole cycle of it. You know, if we make a car, which has we all probably want cars at some level, but all the parts should be recyclable, and they should be when we're done using them, they shouldn't just go into a landfill. But they should. We should think about the whole process mm -hmm. of design from beginning to end. Uh, as an example, or as you know, not making such a disposable uh, objects. Yeah. And I think the most environmental building or objects is something, uh, if a building lasts a thousand years, it doesn't matter if the materials come from all over the world. There's something inherently sustainable 
not making things that last a long time. Yeah. So, so, so this whole thing about functionality, better objects, and making them sustainable. So, that we, you, you mean so we can recycle them, and so you can recycle yeah. them, or they last for. Mm. You know, you don't want to just build a building that's only good for thirty years. Mm. You know, you want to build something that's good for a hundred years or a thousand yeah. years. We need to think longer term. Yeah, but this go, does it go fast enough? I would like to ask. Uh, maybe uh, you could expand yeah, on the so same I, question, Eva. Yeah. So I, I agree with with Ky what Kyle is saying. I think uh, not. Um, more products, better, but quality-wise, uh, better thought through, and I think that is putting much more uh, thought process into the whole design, uh, giving that, uh, that, that needs more uh, investment. Mm. So it's not about just putting stuff out, but it, getting to the very best point where it's going to serve people the very best for mm. a longer time. But that was not our economic model. Mm. So what is ha has to happen is that we, we're creating a new economic model yeah. that design can follow with. So it's a new awareness, it's new systems, it's new uh, you know, production, um, circular production. We're to, to the toolkit of designing where you know, cost, time, scope was our tripod. We have to put a new toolkit in that is where are the materials from, where are they coming from, like just with the labeling on the food, mm -hmm. we're getting to that point people know, have to know what exactly is in exactly. the product. Exactly. And then how, you know, is it, is it going to hold up? I'd like to pick up on, on two things. You mentioned both the financing, yeah. is, uh, which is necessary, obviously, uh, but also the value chain. Could you expand a little bit also how that influences your work? Well, I think, um, I think, I think right now design, architecture and design is, uh, in general, struggling to get the right budgets to build because competition is hard and <clears throat> people want more for less, but do they, do they get the right thing with the quality and with uh, that lifespan, that is really a good investment. So, uh, and <clears throat> we're still new at coming up with these new systems, so we have to get good at that. But I think as, as architects and designers, there's something very important that we also have to do in the design process, and that is that we work in a field of predicting the future, but to do that, we look to the past, from the present, to, to get to know what we don't know, uh, which is going to be the future. And in, in that process coming from here, going back, going forward, um, there's a lot of uh, analysis and understanding that has to be processed into a building or an object. It's the exciting part about architecture. You get to try to not predict, but uh, make a better future. And you know, and, it, and we layer. It gets layered and layered and layered. And, and it's really, it's it's one of the driving. It's one of the f the most amazing parts about doing architecture. I think. Well, yeah, it's you know, that's the that's it's the drive. A, it's a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility. It right. is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's continue. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which of your tasks would you happily let a robot do, if any? Yeah, sure. I think there's great tasks for robots. Cleaning my house. I would love just talking about architecture. Yeah, oh, <laughs> and architecture. Oh, I I think you know what well, we do. We have we don't you know we have all of our computer our drawings done on computer. It's not robots doing them, but there's so much automation to it, and you know you wouldn't want to give up the the human part of it. But there are construction elements, and there are making of of a product. Or you could even make buildings with, you know, with technology mm -hmm. that is robotic. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, you know. And we're already starting to do it with a lot of the machinery yeah. that's that make that's making things. And it's different than using your hands. Some things you want handmade, but other things it's okay to have machine made. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I agree. I mean, already a lot of production is computer, uh, you know, is robotic uh, furniture. Most furniture is um, made robotically nowadays, quite, you know, it's machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think also right now this uh, school in all, architecture school in Aarhus have a whole robotic center set up. Mm -hmm. Switzerland is also doing, I know schools, I'm sure MIT, 
so they're also they're focused on it, they're studying it, and yes, it is of course coming in. I still think what is wonderful is that we have the bespoke with a high tech, and that merging is a really interesting point right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the artisans, for, for me as an architect, the most wonderful thing is to work with a really skilled artisan. It's um, that the, the experience between bra you know, brain and hand is something very unique to human uh, that has to get expressed. We're going to translate that into the robot. And we will see where that goes, but it's still, you know, it's still humans for now <laughs> that are <laughs> that are. But you see it as an that. opportunity. I it sounds like you I see it definitely like an opportunity yes. uh, for the future for us to be able it to create what you want to I create. Mean, cars are it's already built yeah. by, you and know, it's not even the future. It's it's here. I mean, you it's, know, it's, it's here. And it's what? How do how do we how do we not lose the artisan and the crafts yeah. while things are mass produced? Right, let's continue. What's your utopia? Utopia. Ah, my utopia is, um, I love my cities dense and my beaches empty. And this combination of the two is really what my utopia is. How, does, how do you do that? I love being with people. I thrive on it. Mm -hmm. And I love being kind of isolated too, that balance. And my utopia toggles between those two places. As long as you choose yourself when to be exactly. on the beach or when to be in the city, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Eva, what is your utopia? Oh, I, I, I think, um, I think we have experienced, um, a, you know, I think planet Earth, in the universe, is a very special planet. It's the blue marble. When you look at Earthrise, the the image, I think, is just uh, a very amazing place in the universe, and uh, I think. Uh, paradise is here with a lot of challenges that we have to uh, deal with. Mm -hmm. um, I personally like to uh, engage, but also have my alone time. So you're, you're, you know, you're social and you're a monk. You know, you're, you're always going between those two worlds. <laughs> if we go to the personal, so. Yeah. But. Okay. Uh, I think we are sort of on uh, giving uh, good recommendations here. Which book should every designer read? If you can mention only wow. one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so because we have this, if I may, I Go don't know if in. I was just, yes, yeah. So uh, I think one uh, book, since we have this theme of the power of design connecting culture to nature, uh, Carl Bosfeld, uh, a German photographer that uh, has inspired um, architects around the time of Bauhaus, created a whole uh, catalog of art forms in nature. Uh, of photographs, so it's not really a book to read, it's a book to engage in, but it was really how art forms <coughs> and structures inform design and architecture. It was something that Jan Utzen uh, was very inspired by and a lot of architects in the 20th century, and I think it's something to revisit with the, all the biomic, micro, the whole thing that we're into now. Uh, other books to read, there are, there are a few, and Obviously, yes. yeah. God, it's, it's so hard to think about which books they recommend to read. I, yeah. I am, um, you know, I'm not one who is inspired a lot by books, which is so weird to say. It just was not my, my go-to point. I'm not much of a reader. Uh -huh. But there is something about when you read poetry and to think about poetry books and old poetry, like, you know, and, and it just, it allows you to open up to other things. And I, I would, I was, Think, I mean, I read some of the Rumi's poetry and I think of that, but I don't have a specific book. I'm just not a reader. Maybe that's why I do film or involved in film. You, you express in a different way. <laughs> yeah. This is perfectly okay. <laughs> but I think the poetry part is, uh, is yeah, good. I, I agree I've with you. I've had to be honest yeah, about my reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, give a piece of advice you wish someone had told you. Should we start with you then, Karen? Um, someone piece of advice someone told me. Oh, all, you had when, known before yeah, or when you yeah, were younger. Yeah. It's all going to be all right. Like when you're younger, you don't know that. And you're just like struggling to figure out how to make things perfect to go back or do things just right. And you realize that there's only a, most thing when in life, actually in buildings also, there's a few critical things that you got to get right. And then everything else kind of follows, follows into that. 
and you got to understand what are those critical things to get right. So not being so worried not to get it all worried. get get it always right. I think that's important. In? I think um, what comes to mind is uh, be vision driven. Um, I mean, it's always do with do with passion. Um, I think that's what you're going to excel at. But I also think when you do that, um, create your vision. And Why is that, that important? Because I think the vision uh, makes the decisions. And um, I think that and it evolves. It's not, it's going to evolve if you, you it's, going with, it's always going to evolve with the stages you're in in life. And yeah. it's, but I think that will give you um, maybe a bit of a stronger purpose. And I think two great advices, actually. And you're right, when you're younger, you don't necessarily think like that, right? Yeah. Neither on the, well, it's going to be OK, or actually be the visionary. Yeah, and when you're younger, too, at least for me, you don't, you don't let things come to you, mm. trying so hard to get things and pushing so hard. Mm. And as you get a little bit older, you kind of realize that if you step back, things will come towards you also. Right. When you seek, you find. Yeah. <laughs> Google. <laughs> Right. New question. If you could wake up tomorrow having gained any one quality or ability, what would that be? Mm. Eva. Uh, I, well, even more awareness, uh, I think. Um, love to play an instrument better. Yeah. <laughs> That's just something I, you know, played guitar when I was a child. But you know, so I know. But I think um, awareness is going to be one of the things that we are going to need more and more. So it's going to, it's going to be able to help us take old places. Knowledge, knowledge yeah, about this future that you're know, predicting every yes, day. Yes, but in your knowledge work. is a very, you know, it's it's not just knowledge mindset. It's awareness. Awareness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I mean, I thought my first thing was thinking about instruments and playing music, or it's like a language. Uh, growing up, you know, I, I barely speak English well. I, if I, I don't speak other languages well, I don't play, I don't play instruments, and I wish I had that uh, expansive ability to pick up on these other languages and other ways to communicate. Languages. Yeah. But That's language. interesting because you're American, yeah. whereas I don't think Eva would have said the same thing. No, but I say awareness because awareness is communication, really. Okay. It's mindful communication. And I think what's very interesting and what's happening in our time is uh, also with the whole pandemic yeah. is that we experienced a new connection with yeah. nature, but also with living animals. Yeah. And I think uh, there is a, I mean, you see it on social media everywhere, but I think it's not just language in its different variations, but it's also a mind language. We know the, the rituals of gestures, we know, but the mind language between human and animals is uh, maybe we, you know, we could have them open up to that because it's, and to nature, to trees, trees communicate. This is another great book, The Hidden um, mm -hmm. Life of Trees. Um, uh, it's actually also by a German forestry. It was a bestseller in New York Times. But that is how trees communicate in groups. Uh, they won't do it as well in city environments, but in the forestry, they communicate. So plants communicate. So that awareness for all that, all living things. And what is so specific with nature is it gives life, it takes life. And in between, it communicates. I, I could not think of a better way, because this was the qu last question, uh, to finish the round uh, talking about actually communication and the language being part of that, but also this awareness that we need to gain. And I think the whole conversation has really evolved about that, uh, how we engage, how we understand better the nature and, and uh, the rest of the world. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for it having has me. Been, uh, it has been really fun. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. So together uh, with our Nordic friends and uh, colleagues from the consulates uh, of uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Iceland, I really hope that uh, after the pandemic you will have a chance to visit Denmark and the Nordic region 
and uh, experience uh, firsthand uh, some of the topics that we have talked about, about design. I hope that you have all enjoyed today uh, and uh, you have gained good insights and you leave inspired and you will go for further explore exploration. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>